The Italian Radio Hour is sponsored by Istituto Mondo Italiano. Mozilla, Mata. Buonasera a tutti, good evening and welcome to the Italian Radio Hour. Io sono Viviana. E io sono Caterina. I'd like to welcome back our regular listeners and also welcome any new listeners and anyone listening online at khbradio.com. Also, be sure to like us on Instagram and Facebook at the Italian Radio Hour. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel to catch up on any past episodes. E io vorrei dare il benvenuto ai nostri ascoltatori da tutto il mondo. Grazie per essere essere con noi anche oggi mentre continuiamo il nostro viaggio per l'Italia e la cultura italiana. On uh, last week's episode, Rina Poletti, the Queen of Tagliatelle, and writer Antonella Iaschi talked about their friendship and the story about l'Elfa Sfollina. I'm not going to pronounce that right, did I? That is absolutely correct, uh, l'Elfa Sfollina. Okay, <laughs> and, and how pasta and poetry um, create joint, joint efforts to create a, a better future. The Italian Radio Hour and Istituto Mondo Italiano are now starting a fundraising campaign to raise funds to get l'Elfa Alfa Sfoglina story project accessible to the language of sign. Uh, so, I mean, the sign language. Yes, uh, indeed. So mm-hmm. American mm-hmm. Sign la Language. Lingua, sì. La lingua, la lingua de segni. Segni. Okay. Mm-hmm. And pl- uh, please stay tuned to uh, find out how to contribute to this mission. But before we get to our guest tonight, let's find out the answer to last week's trivia question. What's the meaning of butta la pasta? Okay, so since it was a, an episode uh, focused on pasta last week, uh, I had to choose another expression I had to do with pasta. And if people were to look up the um, verb buttare uh, in the dictionary, they will find throw. So what, you're going to throw your pasta away? Now, this is usually the t- typical phone call that you get when um, someone maybe is already cooking and the other person might be coming from work and is only a few minutes away. So when they call and say, butta la pasta, it means I'll be home very soon. Obviously, if you're having meat, you might not call and say, butta la pasta. <laughs> 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 Interesting. Okay. Well, tonight we have two very special guests. Um, we're going to start with um, American writer Catherine Wilson. She's the author of the memoir, The Mother-in-Law Cure, Learning to Live and Eat in an Italian Family. Um, the book was originally published in the U.S. in uh, 2016, entitled Only in Naples. Uh, in Italy, it was published under the title La Moglia Americana, and it also has been translated and published in many other languages. Our second guest will be La- Laura, or Laura? Mm-hmm, Laura? <laughs> I'll make her Italian. <laughs> Laura Mangone, uh, creator of the Wedding Cookie Table community, and we'll be talking to her about that. Ma prima, pubblicità. Do you want to learn, improve, or master your Italian? Istituto Mondo Italiano can help. Located in the heart of Regent Square, Mondo Italiano offers small group classes and one-on-one private tutoring to help you learn Italian in no time. Visit us online at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org. And I'm very excited to finally have this conversation with uh, uh, Catherine Wilson, who is actually dialing from Rome, and it's about 11, 10 p.m. her time. Buonasera, Caterina. <laughs> Buonasera. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. And I don't know. Um, now, can you tell us, uh, can you kind of, it's, it's actually weird to have this conversation in English because your Italian is beautiful, and all the interviews that I caught on, on the internet, you, you spoke Italian. I was just uh, so now we uh, get to speak um, English. And it's like it's the first time I got to hear her speak in English. It's <laughs> funny. <laughs> well, complimenti for your English as well. I think we've had kind of parallel but or maybe inverted experiences that you're in the United States but Italian and I'm an American here in Italy for many years. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So um, actually the first uh, thing that struck me when I saw your last name, it brought me back to my tennis days. Are we talking about the same Wilson last name that most people would associate with um, beautiful sports um, equipment? <laughs> so to speak, by chance. Yes, it was, it was my, my great-grandfather who actually had a meatpacking, an important meatpacking company in the U.S., 
And instead of throwing away the cow hides and the skin of the pigs, he started making footballs and baseballs and tennis rackets and other sporting goods. So it was that was the beginning of Wilson of Wilson Sporting Goods. We're, the family doesn't have anything to do with it anymore, but the but the name is is the same. It is the same. So just uh, to uh, compliment the, the the introduction, uh, so that our guests uh, who um, a lot of them have already commented they love your book and who. Who wouldn't? It's such a pleasant uh, read. Uh, but um, uh, you start also in, in the back with a uh, quote by Good, um, see Naples and die. And uh, you started this journey and you were, you were um, fresh from uh, Princeton, I believe. Um, yeah. Ended up going to Italy, specifically Naples, for an internship. That one Naples that everyone was advising you to skip on your grand tour. Is that correct? <laughs> That's right. Everyone said it's a wonderful idea to go to Italy, but go somewhere tranquillo, go somewhere like a small town in Tuscany, uh, in Umbria, in northern Italy. Um, they said, wherever you go in Italy, it's beautiful, but the one thing you need to do is to avoid Naples because they said it's dirty and it's dangerous and it's corrupt and there are all of these awful things about it. And so the more I heard that, the more I thought, Oh, I want to go to like Naples. It's a very interesting place. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting to me why everybody... And then I would say, well, have you been there? And they would say, no, 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 we haven't been there. It's, it's best to avoid Naples. And what happened is um, I decided to go to explore this place, and it ended up being a really life-changing experience in a very positive way. Um, indeed. And uh, so this, uh, this, this book, this uh, memoir... Um, the the message that you get out of it is actually a dual love, um, one with what will become your mother-in-law, Raffaella, and uh, which uh, will get to her, but also your appreciation for this um, um, city that has many dichotomies because you have the personal life that is a certain way, the, the public sphere of the Neapolitans is, uh, is different. But it seems that this is the place where you actually started to live, where you started to flourish. Um, so tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your experience when you got there before we get to the date with Salvatore. But your first impressions once you got to um, Naples. Well, I was from a very um, achievement oriented East Coast background upbringing. And it, I was very rational. Everything, including my appetites and including the way I ate and the way I lived, was very monitored and controlled. And what I found when I re- arrived in Naples was that it was a place where I could really live in my own skin in a very different way. So the Italian word is carnale. Mm-hmm. I saw the people around me, especially the women, and I and. And I saw that they just were comfortable in their own skins and with their own appetites and with their love of life in a way that I had never been before. And so I realized that this place had a lot to teach me. And the teaching was not a sort of intellectual, rational teaching, but it was a teaching through all of the senses. Because if anybody has been to Naples, they know that it's it seduces you through all of the senses. There's this extreme dramatic beauty, the smells, the food that is just divine. Um, and it's also very chaotic and very um, unpredictable. Um, but all of that served to, um, to kind of find a humanity that I hadn't really experienced in my East Coast American upbringing. Mm-hmm. And uh, talking about humanity, um, um, the, the, the main character that we all fell in love with is um, <clears throat> your mother-in-law, your suocera, Raffaella. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, who, you know, in the way that you portray her um, and seen also pictures, you know, the way you describe the highlights, the way that she closes her fridge with, you know, elegantly then flipping the, the meatballs and, and, and so forth. She really kind of embraced you. And uh, you talk about feeling uh, sfamata, feeling nourished, but that was way beyond um, the food aspect. It was everything that went around it. Um, so uh, what was your, because here in the U.S., 
and I don't want to generalize, but I see my day gets pretty frantic. So there is not much focus on sitting down, consuming the meal. It's almost something that you have to get through to get to something else. So how is that switch of gears for you? Well, it would be the stereotype of the Italian mother-in-law was kind of like the stereotype of Naples. People said to me, beware, you know, these women who are very protective of their sons, the sons are mamoni, uh, you know, they'll be very skeptical um, of you coming into the house. And that was kind of an idea that, that I had. And then I arrived in this place um, where Salvatore still lived, you know, at 24, it's normal for an Italian to still live at home. And my mother-in-law was, as you said, just absolutely gorgeous, closing the refrigerator with her heel as she's, she'd made something fabulous on the phone, multitasking. And in all of this, she just kind of welcomed me as a daughter immediately without any sort of judgment. Um, and so the wonderful verb imboccare is, you know, spoon feeding, which sounds kind of like baby food in English, but it was sort of the wonderful, the wonderful sensation of her just saying, here, sit down, let me feed you. And um, and it, it it was just just really really beautiful because that I realized quickly that that's the way that Italians express their love and express their acceptance and communicate is through food. And ironically, I sort of you know I'd been dieting all my life, and in Naples I was eating the best food that I'd ever eaten in my life, and I also lost weight because <laughs> because I was being as you said, famata, I was being um, really satisfied on a sort of deep level. I wasn't just eating, as you said, uh, to, you know, get on with my day. It was a matter of being together and communicating and of acceptance and love and immediately being accepted in a family. Yes, when I read the book, uh, actually I read the book years ago and I reread the book, um, uh, one of the things that really struck uh, struck me was that you you mentioned in the book that uh, you had a eating disorder and and moving to Italy and, and being embraced by this family now this eating disorder sort of went away right <laughs> is, is, yes. it, is uh, uh, um, how can you you know how is that uh, something that you know how how did that change that situation well it with was you? kind of yeah it was it was so it was so bizarre because what I what I hadn't realized when I was controlling my appetites and controlling what I ate and thinking about what I ate is that my, I, I wasn't listening to my body on any sort of, you know, deep level. I wasn't, you know, my, the problem wasn't so much the dieting. It was that I would eat a lot and then I would punish myself afterwards. Whereas in Naples, I felt like appetites were celebrated. Mm -hmm. And if you were hungry and you ate a lot, it was this joyful moment of, I've given you something that you love to eat and you're eating it. So why should there be anything negative like guilt or punishment associated with that? And so what happened was I realized, oh, my body eats good things and then it gets hungry again and it can eat more good things. And that's human. <laughs> and that's actually health. You know, as my mother-in-law would say, you know, if you're hungry, it means you're healthy. And so hunger itself was sort of rather than thinking, oh, okay, I need to, I'm hungry, so I need to have a coffee or I need to diet or I need to stave off that hunger. It was, no, I need to really try to satisfy that hunger. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because um, now that you're talking about this, I mean, initially your book was... Uh, published in the states um, under the title "Only in Naples," but when it was when it came out for the next edition, it's published as "The Mother-in-Law Cure," and you know, it was sort of a interesting change. And um, is, is that one of the reasons? Like, why did they change the title? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that you ask because it, it, I mean, those, I think both of the titles are, are accurate in the sense that it's very much about Naples, but it's also very much about my mother-in-law's um, insegnamenti and teachings. But what happened was that um, apparently not in, in terms of the American market, not everybody knows Naples. They think of Naples, Florida. And so the uh, somehow I would never think of Naples, apparently. Florida first, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm sure that I'm sure the listeners on the uh, the, the the Italian radio hour don't think of Naples, Florida. They think of Naples, Italy. But a lot of people apparently, um, you know, paperbacks. The biggest markets are uh, Walmart and uh, and and stores like that. And so apparently, uh, only in Naples doesn't doesn't. Um, there aren't enough Americans that can relate to Naples as a place. And I think this is partially because of the terrible PR that the city gets, because even if you open guidebooks even now about Naples, you'll see, you know, be careful. You could get pickpocketed. You know, it's okay to kind of go through when you're going to the Amalfi Coast, but don't stay too long. Um, And so a lot of Americans don't know the city. Um, and I wanted to give it another little twist uh, because uh, maybe, um, you know, this is also the second stage of your relationship with your mother-in-law where maybe first was on the receiving end, all the teachings, but I'm sure over the years, uh, Miss Rafaela, La Signora Rafaela has learned a lot from you especially on the first trip to the U.S., right? Can you give us some episodes or some little things that you said, uh, Signora Raffaella, here we do a little differently. So I'm sure now the, 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 the relationship is on an even keel. Um, that's, that's my interpretation. Um, so, but um, I'm sure the Avalones have come here to the U.S. And how was that experience for, for you, for them? <laughs> Oh, well, there are a lot of a lot of um, very comical moments uh, that I did, that some of which I describe in the book. But I remember, for example, when um, we went, I, I took Salvatore to a big gym, you know, Gold's Gym in the U.S. Because, you know, they, at that point in Italy, there were no gyms like there are. And he he's, you know, loves sports. And so we went to this place and then he, and then the, the person said, oh, well, you know, we'll have a conversation with you about your interest in joining. But for me, it was just a matter of him seeing the place. And he asks the man if there are any machines that can make my size become slimmer. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, wait, I, I've misunderstood you, dear. And he said, no, 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 you have your kid, you know? Do you have something that will make... Her thighs be slimmer. And I thought, oh, my goodness, this poor person at the gym thought, (laughs) this is is a real problem between these two. But for him, it was just a kind of normal thing. And then I would take them to the food courts in the U.S., which they, I mean, they were just wide-eyed. Because the idea of a food court in Italy would never would would, would never fly. My and my nephews go crazy for the free refills. Food, <laughs> oh yeah, the, the, the free refills. The amount of condiments every time they would go to a restaurant and they would see all of these bottles of things on the table. And I would say, "My kid, don't be a con questi cose. Why do we need all of these sauces?" But they loved it. I mean, it was it was. My mother-in-law went nuts over outlets. I mean, the idea of, a, of an enormous store where you could get these incredible discounts and, you know, I mean, <laughs> yes, yes, you really do kind of discover your own country when you see it through the eyes of, that is, of someone from Italy. That is funny. Also, you know, during your stay in Naples, you became quite fluent in Neapolitans and in Neapolitan. And uh, I'm sure um, if you don't uh, mind sharing it, um, the um, the average engagement year in Italy is about seven. <laughs> but that was not a piece of information that someone had sent you beforehand, right? So <laughs> after the first year of dating, okay, no proposal coming. Maybe the second one, you started to wonder. Can you tell us a little bit? And you know, you know where I'm going. What what we want to hear? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I very naively thought that I would. I would. I think my husband's a good-looking man, and I sort of had this image of him on one knee with a with a, a, a engagement ring, saying, "Will you marry me?" But apparently, that just doesn't happen. You just at a certain point after eight. 10, 12 years decide that it may be time. And so, um, but, you know, we had been together and I didn't know this. So I said to my father-in-law one time when we were together, I said, you know, I don't, I just don't know what Salva's intentions are. I thought maybe he just wants to have the wonderful food of his mama and live at home forever. Maybe this is not, you know, maybe he doesn't want to get married. And my father-in-law said the wonderful Neapolitan expression, which is, 
which means the octopus has to cook in its own juices, which is this wonderful Neapolitan concept of literally an octopus, when you cook it, you, it, you, you're not supposed to add anything to it. You just leave it in the pot to kind of bubble and cook by itself for a long time um, until it's ready. And so the concept was, don't put any pressure on it. Let situations come to their own sort of fruition on their own without pressuring anyone. And so this was the way I realized that my husband was actually not a Prince Charming, but a bubbling octopus. octopus. <laughs> <laughs> so actually something else also for our listeners, um, you are sharing some of the recipes that um, you learn how to make with uh, uh, Raffaella, including insalata di polipo and also the uh, sartu, if I remember correctly, sartu di riso. Um, so how long did you actually live in Naples before moving to Rome? I lived at, well, I lived in Naples the first couple of years, and then I started doing tours of um, theater in Italy. So I would go back to Naples. So Naples was sort of my home base, although I was touring around. And then I moved to Rome, I guess it was about 15 years ago. So, um, so the sort of first impronta was Neapolitan, so both in terms of food and dialect, because as you know, and as probably most of the listeners know, Italy is not a country, but it's made up of lots of different city-states that have their own dialect and own foods and own cultures and own sense of humor and everything. So I feel, in fact, my children say when somebody says, oh, are you American or are you Italian? And they say, we're half American and half Neapolitan. They mm. never say <laughs> we're Italian American. They say we're Neapolitan American, even though they were born and raised in Rome. So, um, so yeah, the recipes are sort of a way that I wanted the reader to, I wanted to invite the reader into the kitchen of my mother in law because you really, when you're next to her in the kitchen, you learn not only how to cook those things, but you learn so many things about the outlook and the mentality and the way of life of Neapolitans. Now your family is living in Rome. How how is your Roman life different now than your Neapolitan life? Well, Rome is I mean, being the capital, it's much more it's more international. It's um it's very different in terms of the history. Naples was always dominated. So Naples is a culture that was dominated for not centuries but millennia. Whereas Rome was the Caput Mundi, Rome was the, the capital of the world. And so this really changes the way people um, react and interact with other people in Rome. Um, Naples is, you know, there, there's the plus side and the, and the minus side, but it is a very, very different culture. And we love going to Naples. It's only one hour on the train. But I find now that I think maybe it might be difficult to live in Naples because it is so different culturally, whereas Rome is more of a European city with people from all over the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, also over the years, I mean, you have mentioned touring with the theater. So and I believe you mentioned before you have many different uh, hats. You, um, and, uh, you're an actor, you're a writer, you're also a dubber, uh, a translator, and you also have become an expert on US life. Uh, if someone turns on to Rai or Mediaset, um, often you are commenting. Um, so um, that is that is wonderful, um, uh, you know, um, role that you have that you can be indeed the translator of both uh, cultures and being able to interpret what's going on on this side of the ocean because you are from here for the Italian um, audience. I'm sure that is something that you really enjoy doing, right? I do. Thank you for saying it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I enjoy it. It's a definite challenge because there's some things, particularly about American politics, that um, obviously Italians don't truly understand. And so you need to, to explain it, but in a way that doesn't, that is not too partisan, that doesn't show your own bias too much about what you believe, but all of us believe something. And so, um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, but it, but again, it's, It's wonderful because it's a growing experience. It makes you really look at your own culture and figure out what you think when you have to, when you have to interpret it to, for somebody else. 
So uh, do you have anything um, cooking for the future? Do you have uh, another book coming out perhaps or uh, some other maybe like more acting or, or uh, 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 dubbing, or dubbing a film in, or something like that coming up that, that our readers might be interested in? Well, I, I am working right now on, I've done a few films recently, and I, I, I do dubbing, but it's mostly Italian things that are, are dubbed into English. And I'm working now in terms of like my own projects on a documentary of um, Neapolitan culture. And I was thinking of writing more about it, but there's something about the visual and the... Um, sounds and the voices and the dialects that made me think I've got to do something that's more um, multimedia oriented mm-hmm. than writing. And so it's going to be in Italian and then hopefully we'll, um, we'll move it to the American market as well. So it doesn't have a title yet, but um, I'm excited about it. Great, and, uh, looking forward to that. Yeah, and it's actually ironic that in the movie, The Two Popes, Idwe Papi, you are an American journalist. Oh yeah, I remember, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> now that you mentioned it, I remember that. Um, also, how, how's your son's soccer team doing? Because I... I, I... <laughs> <laughs> An aside. Thank, thank you for asking. It was a, it was a tragedy this year because Napoli had a chance of winning the title, the Italian title, and that would have been the most exciting thing, not only in my household but the entire city. Um, and they didn't win, so that was a bit of a disappointment. Oh, but wow. um, <laughs> but yeah, now the the kids have grown, and my and they both want to study in the United States, so now they'll have you know their own experience of. A new culture. And now you're feeling that America is so far away, right? (laughs) Why do you have to go so far? I I spent so long saying, oh, it's wonderful because in America they leave early. They leave home early. They're so independent. And now I say, ma che ci stavo stavo pensando? (laughs) Crazy. I shouldn't have said that. I want them close by. We want to thank you very much, Catherine. Grazie mille for taking time. Uh, to be with us tonight. Um, I just want to remind our listeners that uh, Catherine is the author of The Mother-in-Law Cure, Learning to Live and Eat in an Italian Family. I've read it twice, and it is a fantastic book. And, um, ci vediamo a Roma. Yes, ci vediamo a Roma. <laughs> oh, ci vediamo a Roma. Grazie Thank mille. you so much. Di nuovo, it was such grazie. a pleasure to be with you. <laughs> So before we move on, on to the second segment, a little bit of publicità. Applying for dual citizenship? Need documents translated? Istituto Mondo Italiano provides certified translation and interpretation services in 20 different languages. Be sure to visit us at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org. So here we are. And um, this past weekend, I went to a wedding. And I think it was maybe my first uh, wedding here in, in the area. Um, and everything was beautiful. And there were people that had been to many more weddings. And that one question that everyone asked was, where is the cookie table? <laughs> and it's usually the first place that the wedding guests go to before they sit down. They go, with, they go straight to the cookie table. They pick up one of those little containers and they start filling it up full of cookies and start eating cookies before the reception even starts. <laughs> but you might not know about this tradition if you're not from here. So we decided to bring um, on, uh, on air the expert, the one that knows it all. The one and only Laura Magone. Buonasera. Good evening, Laura. How are you? I am fine. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing very well. So, Laura, thank you very much for being here with us because this is such a lovely tradition and you will tell us uh, more about it. Um, but I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes also to talk about your professional background because you also uh, you are from Mon- Monongahela, right? That's your area. Yes, and that you is have my hometown, mm-hmm, Nongahela, Pennsylvania. And you have done also a very nice documentary highlighting uh, the, the, the area. Tell us, for anyone that is not familiar with, a little bit about Monongahela and also the strong Italian connection that um, also triggered my curiosity um, and to, to have you um, here. Because <clears throat> it's not usually a city that a lot of people 
that I have met here come from. So tell us a little bit about Monongahela and the Italianness in uh, uh, of Monongahela. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, Monongahela is a river town. We are located about 26 miles from Pittsburgh, and it's a, a historic town that actually celebrated its 250th anniversary uh, three years ago. And so... Uh, in this town, you will find a lot of historic buildings, a lot of um, traditions. We have inventions that came out of the town. It, it's a very small town, population about 4,000 people. Monongahela never had industry of its own, um, but had. It, it's located in the heart of what had been the American steel industry in the Midmont Valley. And so I think the most important thing about the town is the people. You know, you have wonderful people here. If, if you come to the town and you're trying to find some place and you ask for directions, we're going to probably end up taking you to your destination instead of just trying to explain it to you. Just great, great people. Uh, the, when you ask about the Italianness of, it, of the town, there's quite a bit of it, I would say. And we had many people who traveled from Italy to make Monongahela their home during the industrial era. Uh, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, uh, we have a high concentration of people from northern and southern Italy here. That's and rather we're, we're intriguing because yeah, normally Italian. you don't think we of We also that. have yeah. plenty of other ethnic groups here as well. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, uh, so you, you say there's, uh, there, there's a significant population from northern Italy. Um, did they come to Monongahela to work in the steel industry, or did they work in some other uh, It would aspect? be a combination of folks who came for, they definitely came for industry. Uh, on my maternal side, both of my grandparents are from northern Italy, and uh, my grandfather came to work in the mines. So we had, you know, they, they came for the jobs, but Plenty of people came for jobs in the mills and the mines. Um, and the two towns that I believe you had mentioned when we were kind of exchanging information, it was uh, about Bergamo and Brescia. And by doing a little bit of investigation, um, there is indeed a, a, a city's twinship or sister cities with uh, Ono San Pietro. And uh, delegates came uh, to um, in 2017. Is that correct? You are absolutely correct, and I was remiss in not mentioning that, but, but you are absolutely right. There's a strong tie uh, with the sister city relationship. I'm not from Ono San Pietro, but my understanding is that about half of their population left that village and traveled here, so we have uh, plenty of uh, residents in Monongahela with roots in Ono San Pietro. So uh, how did you come up with the idea of um, the wedding cookie table and, and uh, your Facebook page and the, 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 the whole uh, what, concept of that? Was it a tradition that you grew up uh, seeing? Absolutely. I grew up with the tradition. Uh, as I had said, all four of my grandparents are Italian immigrants, and I'm very proud of that, too, from uh, southern Italy, uh, both in uh, Cosenza in Calabria, and then as you had uh, mentioned, the the two uh, on my maternal side from Brescia and Bergamo, and um, so what what you have in the Midmont Valley, though, we have a lot of ethnic groups represented, and um, and so I grew up with the wedding cookie table, thinking that this was something that people everywhere did. And I should mention, I, while I did start the Facebook page in November of 2015, and I chose to focus on weddings, uh, in, in our region, and when I say region, I'm referring to the, the region where the cookie table tradition took hold, and that would be southwestern Pennsylvania, northern um, 
West Virginia, I'm sorry, and then also Eastern Ohio from Steubenville through Youngstown. Uh, it, it's a region where this tradition of cookie tables took hold. And we celebrate life's events and occasions, I, I call it from cradle to grave, with cookie tables, everything from christenings and baptisms through First Holy Communion, birthdays, everything that happens up to retirement parties and funerals. Uh, and any time a family has a tragedy, we're going to send comfort food to them. And part of that has to do with cookies. So, Do you know the origin of it historically? Part, I'm sorry? Do you know the origin of it historically? When did this concept start? Uh, was it in the 19th century? Was it in the 20th century? I'll tell you, it's something that I have been researching for a few years, actually, and this is something that happened organically. Uh, now, in this day and age, cookie tables uh, are very well planned and curated and orchestrated uh, right down to the last detail. But when they started, it started, cookie tables started as an act of generosity uh, to a large extent with the immigrants coming from many traditions, not just the Italians. People who talk to me, you know, think I focus on the Italians a lot, and I do because that's my background. But uh, you can look at many ethnic backgrounds, a lot of the Eastern Europeans, uh, Greeks. We could go right down the list. So whenever these folks were living together in the blue-collar communities, they started celebrating life events together, and it happened naturally that people would show up with food and cookies to celebrate. In my own family, my parents were married in 1947, and they did not have a cookie table, but... I will tell you that this is one of the ways that tradition started. One of their paisans showed up with a bushel of pizzelle that nobody mm -hmm. asked her to bring. But, you know, people then started eating these cookies at the wedding. And I, I think that this is, this is partly how the tradition started. Yes, I'm from... Um Western New York and of Italian background, and I went to many weddings, and we would have maybe a few cookies, but you would never have anything like we have here in, in Pennsylvania. Yeah, and that, that, leads, that leads me again to um, the, the community that you have created on Facebook that I'm also a, a shy member of, <laughs> and uh, just uh, the artistry, um, but mainly the support, the recipe sharings, and the um, asking for advice. It really represents the idea of community, and kudos to you, Laura, for, you know, um, orchestrating straight in this group and to all the members that are there contributing because uh, I have learned a lot and um, I think it was at the beginning of this radio program a few months ago there was uh, um, you're also involved your group is involved in a lot of fundraising events and uh, I believe this was for some uh, senior care facilities and I again shyly volunteered to um, bake uh, some canestrelli and I felt that you know good about that participation because I was like it was kind of my um, entrance so to speak my official entrance in instead of just being a post reader <laughs> that I was uh, um, active and uh, so yes let's talk about this beautiful this beautiful group that you this great community and uh, the many events that you have call up um, um, the bakers and say, let's support this, let's, because a cookie will always put a smile on anyone's face. So do you have some uh, maybe campaigns that are going on right now or some recent ones um, that you would like to share? Sure. And the reason that this, this Facebook community gets involved is because really – of the composition of the heart of a baker. Bakers uh, are very generous people who, who like to do things for others. And so, uh, as you said, Viviana, the people in the group are very um, willing to share advice, share recipes, and help each other out. 
And in the uh, a few years ago, whenever we had the the Tree of Life shooting in Pittsburgh, we sent cookies to the Zone Four City of Pittsburgh police officers. And and it occurred to me that whenever I would just suggest let's look at doing something, these bakers just turned out, and they were so supportive and so generous. So what what I do now is to look around to see what what is happening out there that we can support. Who could use a hand right now or a lift up, especially during this pandemic? It is so tough for people right now. So we've supported many, many good causes. One that we did recently, just on April 23rd, was the metastatic breast cancer fundraiser. Uh, That's a group of people who actually have metastatic breast cancer, and um, they were holding a fundraiser to raise money to do cancer research, really people who were trying to save their own lives. And um, they asked if we would do a cookie table at the event, and we we did. I, I think the members of this community turned out and created something spectacular. And so every couple months we look to see what it is that we can support. Uh, right now I have been looking to see if there's something that we could do in Uvalde, uh, Texas, and... Um, to see if there would be an interest in having us set up a cookie table there in the next month, and it looks like we'll be able to do that. So this one will be a little different because our members will, by and large, be shipping cookies to Texas, and we're just working on the details of that right now. Uh, But I'm selective with what I pick, but what I know is whenever I go to the membership base and say, what do you think about this? They will support the effort in a big way. We've never had a, an event that didn't work out for us. So sometimes happy events, sometimes sad ones. Um, the, the, um, when arranging a cookie yeah. table, so if it's someone is in inexper- inexperience, are there some must-haves cookies um, uh, that are omnipresent on a cookie table? Yeah, they're yeah. classic. The classic uh, <laughs> one, that, that, regardless of what cookie table I go to, what am I always going to see? Yes, and I have actually stood with a video camera at cookie table lines, interviewing people on what are their favorites. I've done surveys asking people what are their favorites, and I will share with you what some of them are. But what I what another thing that amazed me was that just as this cookie table phenomenon is regional for us, so are the cookies that we bake. And if you, you know, jump on a plane and fly to Florida or California or some other state and go to a bakery, you're just not going to find the cookies that we have around here. And that that was something that really, really uh, caught me off guard. But... The number one cookie, every single survey that I have done, always comes back to the lady lock. I was yeah. just, I was just <laughs> mouthing she that word. She pulled out of her twenty dollars, and she was going to bet on that. I was just that. saying lady locks. <laughs> See, I should have asked. I should have asked you that. Yeah, um, that's, that's what so I was going to say. The, but you would have gotten it right from what you're saying, and I'm counting on you that you're there with each other, that you're telling me you you both would have gotten that one. Um, I I. Would wouldn't because um, um, oh. and she's a little more experienced. I would go for what I would love to see. <laughs> well, I just know I've seen what people go for. They all go for the lady the, locks. They're, easy, they're just kind of like, I don't want to say like cigarettes, but you know what I mean. It's just like you just put one in and um, yeah, and, and you just go for the next one, the next one. <laughs> Well, usually the lady locks go first. You know, if you <laughs> those are the ones that go that are that are that are eaten first, and, and there's they a couple are. other no, ones too, aren't about there? The lady lock. Uh, if if you wanted me to say a couple of words, um, the lady lock is sometimes called a clothespin cookie. Oh. Any oh, guess never heard why that. it's called a clothespin cookie? Hmm. hmm. Um, I have no it idea. It was actually made by wrapping the pastry dough around oh, a wooden clothespin. Oh, okay. 
That's how they were acting. <laughs> you know, the clothespin you would hang in your backyard you used to hang your laundry on. Yeah, the old wooden line. ones. Yeah. I've, uh, the, the, yeah. They were sort of rounded. I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old okay. enough to remember that. <laughs> okay. So um, people would season them, wrap aluminum foil around them, and, and then use them for baking. And they, they would save them just for baking. Like they didn't take them off the clothesline and then run inside and bake with them also. Um, but then they're filled with a, a, a just a, a wonderful uh, cream filling. So that would be... One of the top. Did, did you want me to share any other? I'm going to guess, like, I'm gonna guess a couple okay. other. Okay, those, <laughs> those pecan tassy things are are big. Oh, definitely pecan tassies. Definitely. Um, and then the ones that have the little Hershey kiss in them. I don't know what they're called. They have it's the little the peanut butter blossom. Yeah, and that. Those, they're they're an older cookie than what you might think. I'm working on a project now where I'm including recipes that are 50 years old or older. And that cookie has actually been around for about 50 years. So that's another popular one, yes. And then the one that looks like a peach. That, oh, that was the yeah. one that yeah, I, I don't know what that's called yeah. either. But. It's a peach. Italian peach <laughs> cookie. It's yeah. in Italy, absolutely. Yeah. Although here I don't think you have access to Alkermes, which is the liqueur that creates that um, peach color so you have to resort to some food coloring um if if i'm still correct on the import <laughs> loss of I'm gonna guess, yeah i'm gonna guess the pizzas are probably up there too absolutely that's one that will be coming out of my family's home the pizza uh-huh. and the biscotti absolutely must have now you can take the pizza whenever it's warm and roll it mm-hmm. and put that put the same filling in there that you put in a lady lock like a rolled pizza and um, the, the people love those also. Mm-hmm. And uh, you mentioned uh, a cookbook. And if I remember correctly, there is already a first iteration of a cookbook that you have put together. Is it still out there? My first, my first project will be coming out hopefully this year. Uh, the, the printing industry is in a, a bad state right now. So they're, they're actually not fulfilling orders until the very end of the year. So, uh, But, yes, I have something that, that I expect to have coming out. And, and this one looks at the history and the heritage of the, uh, the wedding cookie table and the recipes and the stories behind them. Uh, re- recently, um, I read something about the World Guinness Record on cookie tables. Absolutely. Um, can you tell <laughs> us something about the, this, uh, this interesting accomplishment? Like, how big is the world's largest cookie table? How many cookies are on it? That was fun. That was a fun event. We did that in Monongahela in Chess Park on August the 11th of 2019. And... We brought a Guinness judge in. We wanted there was no record, so we actually set the record. We established it for the first time, and um, they were. It was complicated how they decided if they would count your cookie or not because you had to list all of the ingredients. The cookies that we had that were counted equal 88,425. Wow. I remember it was 88. <clears throat> it was in the 80,000. Yep. Mm-hmm. That was fun. That was a very fun day. We keep waiting to see who's going to challenge us because we would love to do that all again, but so far nobody's challenged I us. was going to say, can someone go and I think you can still go and beat your own record, but you would want to see who is coming up with something (laughs) as glamorous as uh, what you and your bakers have um, really done. Again, kudos to all the people that I wish we had names and acknowledge. Uh, We just, you know, uh, it's such a vibrant uh, uh, community. Um, Any other upcoming projects that that you would like to share uh, or um, just tell people how to be involved in, in this community? Sure. Well, I think the the next event that we will have will probably be the one in Texas. We would like to do something. We're we're looking for underserved populations, and some of my members have approached me and said that they would like to do something for children. 
And so we're, we're looking to see if, if anyone has an idea for a group of children that we could prepare a cookie table for. We would be glad to do so. Um, but if anybody is interested in joining, the page last Tuesday we got our 100,000th member. And wow. that was a big, um, that was a yeah. fun day for me. Complimenti. Uh, but they would just go to Facebook. Our group is called the Wedding Cookie Table Community. And even though we're a virtual group, uh, plenty of us get together in person to talk about cookies and baking. And um, anybody can, you know, go to Facebook and find us and feel free to join. Yes, but because... We've, we've just grown naturally. I mean, mm-hmm. it's nothing that I set out to try. Mm-hmm. I was thrilled when I hit 1,000 members, so to hit 100,000 was kind of shocking. Yes, and uh, again, it's also the, the, you know, the sense of support that everyone uh, feels uh, when being part of, uh, whether it's other people posting pictures and getting ideas or someone making their first attempt asking for recommendation or sharing their little their little success. So again, uh, thank you for your wonderful moderation. And Laura, I hope to meet you in person very soon. Maybe I'll be dropping off with some cookies um, again soon. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> our hour is almost up. Um, so uh, we would like to thank you very much. Yep. It was my honor to be here, and I will look forward to meeting you. I saw both of you on um, TV today. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, that was the Pittsburgh so Today job. Live. Great, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, yes, our Big Bang clock has set stop also today. And it's time for us to say arrivederci e alla prossima. We want to thank you all for listening. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at the Italian Radio Hour at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. And uh, Viviana, who are going to be our guests next week? Well, uh, next week, our guests will be producer and director of the highly acclaimed documentary Stracci, Silvia Gambi and Tommaso Santi. I highly encourage our listeners to actually watch this documentary, which is in English and is available on Amazon Prime before our talk, because it will give you a full perspective of the cycle of our clothes from production to recycling. Very, very um, engaging and it was also shown and um, international film festivals um, this year. It's fantastic. Well, I want to remember. I want you all to remember that uh, if uh, you or any of your family or friends have missed a prior episode, or if you'd like to listen to this episode again, please visit our website at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org and click on the Italian Radio Hour. Yeah. Vorremmo ringraziare le nostre ospiti Catherine Wilson e Laura Magone, il nostro sponsor Istituto Mondo Italiano e alla Boara per la musica. And finally, before we leave, here is our trivia question for next week. What does essere alla frutta mean? Again, what does essere alla frutta mean? You can send us your answers to um, the Italian Radio Hour at gmail.com or if you see the post on Facebook, you can always comment in there. And if you're not in the Pittsburgh area or you might be traveling, remember, you can catch us uh, streaming live at khbradio.com every Thursday at 5 p.m. And be sure to like us on Instagram and Facebook at the Italian Radio Hour. Until next time, alla prossima. Ciao, ciao. ciao.
The Italian Radio Hour has been sponsored by Istituto Mondo Italiano.